and we can start with today's session. So today we're going to be looking at confidence intervals. Uh, but before we start with the session, just to recap on the session plan for the next couple of questions that we're going to have. So, oh, I didn't realize that I have split it in this manner. Yes, but it's, it's still fine because today is the 7th of August. So we're dealing with confidence interval for the mean and for the proportion. And next week, we're going to be looking at hypothesis testing for the mean. And then the following week, which will be the 21st, we will look at doing more activities relating to confidence interval and hypothesis testing. And then the last week of August, uh, we will look at, we will do question and answer for those who are still struggling and they are still unsure of certain things and they want clarity on certain things. We will host a question and answer session there. I will prefer for the question and answer session when we get to the 28, those who are still struggling, send me your questions so that we can use those questions um, as part of the question and answer. We are able to display that it will save us a whole lot of time for uh, to do that as well and then we will talk about september when september is close by okay so that that is the sessions that we're gonna have okay so to start with this week's session which is confidence intervals you require statistical tables and today we're going to introduce a new table a t a t test table um, to find the critical values, but I will explain all this later on. You need to know the formulas. Um, there are three formulas that we're going to, um, to introduce, plus other things that will support the formula, like calculating the critical values and all that, which support the confidence interval formula. And you always, obviously, this is stats, uh, it's like maths, we always calculate, so you need a calculator. <clears throat> By the end of the session today, uh, you should be able to understand the basic concepts of confidence interval. Remember in your module, you are not going to be asked only to calculate something. You can be asked to describe or answer questions relating to the content or the concepts that are um, associated with that section. So for example, with confidence intervals, you need to know the basic concept. You need to know how it is built up. What do each one of those things mean? and how do they influence each other? And we will get to that and you will understand those basic concepts of confidence interval, including also how do we build the confidence interval? So you, by the end of the session, you will learn how to construct, which is how to build the confidence intervals for the population mean when the population standard deviation is known and when it is unknown. It is very, very important that you know to differentiate between the two because we will use two different tables for finding the confidence interval for those. Then you also need to know how to construct and or develop a confidence interval for the proportion. So the proportion and the population standard deviation where it's known, they use the Z table for where the population standard deviation is unknown, we're going to use a T table and we will explain that um, as the session progresses. Uh, this is just to give an outline of what we're going to be looking at. So like we said, we're going to be looking at confidence interval. There are two groups popul where population mean, uh, sorry, for the population mean and for the population proportion. And when it comes to the population mean, so it means they would have given you the standard deviation, they will give you the mean, then you know that you're calculating the confidence interval for the population mean. If they give you proportions like percentages, and if they didn't give you percentages, they will give you observation satisfying that. Uh, <coughs> and you will know that you are dealing with proportion or they can tell you that calculate for the proportion of this 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 uh, population you will know that you're dealing with 
population proportion confidence interval. When it comes to the mean, you, there is two key things that you need to remember when you're calculating confidence intervals for the population mean. And this, you're going to also remember it when we do our section next week, because the same principles that we are going to apply today, you will need to also remember them to apply them next week with a couple of other additional things. So for this week, you need to know that if your population standard deviation is given or stated, or it is part of the statement, so it means it is given in the statement, then you will be finding the confidence interval for the mean when the population standard deviation is known. If the population standard deviation is not given or mentioned anywhere in the statement, they would have given you the sample standard deviation. You need to be able to identify that this question they have given me the population standard deviation or they have given me the sample standard deviation. And we will look at more examples just so that you are able or look at a couple of examples so that you are able to place when a question is asked, whether is this a population standard deviation or is this a sample standard deviation? That is very, very important because calculating the critical values or the Z values will be different because you're going to find the critical values on two different tables and that critical value can change the answer to your question. If you use the wrong critical value, you will get the wrong answer. So it is very, very important to know the two, to be able to differentiate the two, but I will going to go through that. OK, so now let's understand and unpack what confidence intervals are. So with confidence interval, we always work with a point estimate. And a point estimate, you must always remember that it is that one value that estimates your population, right? That is your point estimate. And with your point estimate, and your estimate can be for the, uh, the mean or the proportion, right? With that point estimate, we want to know where in terms of the confidence interval does it fit in? Is it inside the confidence interval? Is it from the lower and the upper confidence intervals? Does that include your point estimate or does it um, belong outside of the confidence interval? And we're going to calculate those confidence limits or the confidence interval so that we can determine whether your point estimate will, will be within or outside of the confidence interval. And we use the point estimate to create this limit. We use that because at the end of the day, when you have your population parameter, let's say it is the mean population parameter, we want to know that that estimate that we assume that the sample estimate is this, we want to make sure that when we calculate the confidence interval, that population estimate falls within this limit. Therefore, it means it should include the population interval, even though we're using our point estimate, which is our sample uh, statistic to calculate this uh, limit. But at the end of the day, because we want to make sure that we infer back the results to the population. We need to make sure that this interval or this confidence interval includes the population parameter. OK, so let's unpack this further. <clears throat> so we know what our population parameters are. Remember, this is things that you learned in chapter one or study unit one, where we learned that when we have a population, the measures we collect from the population, we call them parameters. For the mean is the mu, for the proportion is the pi. And when we talk about the sample, it is when your population is huge and you take a subset of that population and you sample uh, that population by applying the sampling method. And that sample, when you calculate some measures from that, they create what we call statistic. And the statistic it is what we're going to refer to in this section or in this study unit as our point estimate. So we're going to refer to the mean, which is your X bar, 
and your P for your sample proportion, right? So those are the two things. The population mean and the population uh, proportions, you're not going to use them as much and they are not going to even have any influence as much on the calculations themselves. But we can, if they are asking you to interpret it, we can use that to interpret the confidence interval. But it's not required in your module to interpret the confidence intervals. But I'm going to show you anyway. So with confidence interval, we want to try and check how much of uncertainty is associated with the point estimate of a population parameter. That is what we want to check. So we want to make sure that if we're looking at the confidence interval, that is what I just explained previously. If we're looking at the confidence interval, how much of this confidence interval does it include the, po uh, the population parameter in it? And an interval estimate will provide us with more information about the population characteristics than does a point estimate because an interval will help us because it's a wider range. It says it starts from here to there, whereas with the point estimate, it tells us at that single point, at that point. So it will not give us a, uh, a clearer or more information about the population, right? And with the um, with those limits that we try to create or the interval estimates that we are trying to create, we are going to call them confidence intervals. And that is what you will learn how to calculate or how to construct. With a confidence interval, it gives you, or the estimate of that interval, it gives you a range of values. And this takes into consideration the variation in the sample statistics from sample to sample, that's one. And these are based on the observation from one sample because we are collecting only one sample. And it gives information about the closeness to the unknown population parameter because at this point, sometimes you will not be given this population parameters, but it will give you some sort of a close estimate to what your population parameters should be between, right? And it can be stated in terms of the level of confidence. Now, don't get confused with these terminologies that we're using, like level of confidence. You have done the level of confidence, you have used it before. Uh, we, we have calculated it or we have found it before and so on. So I'm gonna explain to you so that it makes it easier for you to understand. But we're going to calculate the confidence interval or create or construct the confidence interval using the level of confidence so that when we interpret the results, even in study unit nine, when we do hypothesis testing, we need to make sure that when we interpret the results, we say we are 95% confident or we are 90% confident or we are 99% confident, or we are 80% confident because of the confidence level that we would have used. So, but with confidence intervals as well, you can never say you are 100% confident because there are always those margin of error. And we're going to discuss the margin of error at the later stage, just to give you some idea in terms of what do we mean? That margin of error, which is, to include, because you're using the point estimate and always when you calculate something from an estimate or from the statistic or from that sample uh, parameter or sample statistic measure, you are not talking about the true population. There will be some uh, little errors in terms of how you, how you pull the data out from the population to a sample and so on. So those margin of errors, we can explain them and we can calculate them and we can estimate how much of the margin of error will be. If I'm doing a 95% confidence interval, therefore it means my margin of error is 5%. Therefore I'm allowing that 
the data that I have drawn, the calculation that there is a margin of error of 5% for a 95% confidence interval. I know that now I'm talking Greek to you, but let us move on. So let's look at, uh, at a high level, an example of how do we calculate a confidence interval. We're going to do this in more detail. So we're going to look at the serial fill example. So if I'm, I work in this company and we've got um, a company that produces cereal and we box it in a um, in the box of 750, uh, 750 grams or in one cage kilograms. But I want to find out if my population mean says um, the uh, the average of um, of the boxes, the weight of the boxes is 368. Let's assume that, right? With the population standard deviation of 15%, or 15, sorry, of 15. So I know my population parameter because of all the boxes of cereal that we have already packed. And I know what the standard deviation of the weight of those boxes are. And I've calculated it, it's 15. If you take a sample of those boxes that the factory produces, right? And let's say our sample we only select from uh, maybe there were thousands because I don't know what the population size was. So, but all I know is there is this factory that produces thousands and thousands of cereal boxes. If I select from those thousands and I select only 25 of those boxes, and I go and calculate my confidence intervals, uh, which looks like this. This is the formula. I'm going to explain the formula to you in a bit. Just hold on to that, uh, which takes your population mean, because at this point I'm, I'm having my my real population mean, my population mean of, 600, of 368 plus or minus, which will give me my interval limit. My upper interval, I'll calculate it using the plus. My lower limit interval, I'll calculate using a minus. The 1.6 is our critical value, and our critical value here, it is our Z value. But I'm going to explain to you how do you get the critical value. This is a Z value. So we, you get this on the Z table. And if it's not a Z value, it will be if let's assume this is a normally distributed table. So yeah, because we have our population standard deviation, this is our Z value. So our Z value of 1.96 and this Z value is from a confidence interval of 95% confidence interval. I know that because I'm going to show you how to get to 1.96. Multiply this by the standard error. You remember the standard error? We spoke about it or we learned about it in study unit 7 from the sampling distribution. So multiply this with the standard error, which is your population standard deviation divided by the square root of your sample size. And we know our sample size is 25, our standard deviation is 15. And this gives us our lower limit of this confidence interval of 362 and our upper limit of 373.88. And this is contained in a 95% of the sample means. But now you don't worry about asking me where is the sample mean? Why did I use the population mean? You are going to be given the sample mean here because I was not given the sample mean. I've got the population. I use the parameter, the, the population. Now, because now I know the population, I'm able to use it. When you don't know your population, you will be given your sample mean. And you can see here at the bottom, I've got, if I have my sample mean of 362.3, because I was not given the population parameter, I can use the sample mean. And that is what you're going to be using in your module when you calculate or answer any question, a sample mean. And that will give me a confidence interval of 365, 356.42 uh, and 368.18. So this is the confidence interval. Now, this means our population mean of 368 lies between that. It is included in that confidence interval. 
But what about if the interval from possible samples of 25? So if, for example, we have different sample sizes that we picked with different means now, different sample sizes with different means, and we calculate the confidence interval for each one of them. So for this one, we calculated it previously, and we were able to see that it contains our population mean. The second <coughs> sample that we drew, sorry, the second sample that we drew from uh, gave us the confidence interval of 363.62 and the upper limit of 372. And that does, and that it does include our population mean of 368. Looking at the third sample, where the sample statistic was 360, when we calculated the confidence intervals, it was between 354 and 365. As you can see, that interval does not include our population mean. And that's how you can evaluate your confidence interval. You can use confidence interval to evaluate whether you are able to infer back the results you get to the population or not, because it will tell you whether it does include or it does not include your population mean. But in your module, you are not expected actually to also know how to interpret your confidence interval. You just need to know how to construct them and how to answer some of the basic questions because some of these basic concepts, you just need to know them as well. What do they mean? So in practice, you only take one sample, one sample size n, and you do not, if you do not know your mean or your population mean, so you do not know if the interval will actually contain the population mean or not. And that is hence in your module, you do not interpret the confidence intervals because you are not, most of the time you will not be given the population um, mean. So how would you know whether that uh, confidence interval include, it, does it include the population mean? So, <clears throat> Uh, you will not know whether it does include it or not. However, you do know that 95% of the intervals formed in this manner will contain your mean because you would have used your uh, level of confidence. And in the previous exercise, we used a 95% confidence interval. So we can estimate to say based on the confidence interval or the confidence level or the level of confidence that we have of 95%, we can estimate that our population mean is included in this. But even though we don't know for sure that it is included in that. Okay. So how then do we apply this method of estimation? So with confidence interval is just a process of estimating a population parameter that it is included in your intervals in order for you to be able to infer the results. So let's assume that here you have your population where the mean is unknown, then create a sample or you, you find a sample or you, you collect the sample from this population and you use a Sorry about that. And you use a random uh, sampling method and you create this. And from this sample, you calculate the parameter and uh, sorry, the statistic. And you find that the statistic of this sample that you have selected is 50, right? And then you go and calculate your confidence interval. And you find that it is between 40 and 60. Your lower interval is 40. Your upper interval is 60. When you interpret your result, you are able to say, I am, if you apply, or if you used a confidence level of 95, if you use the 95% confidence level, you will say, I am 95% confident that the mean is between 40 and 60, because you would have calculated that. And that's how you will interpret your results. 
using confidence intervals. So I've, we've, we've spoken about confidence intervals and I've showed you the formula or the calculations, but in a nutshell, the formula for calculating the confidence interval is as this. It looks like this. It is your point estimate. Remember, your point estimate can either be any one of the uh, statistic measure, uh, whether it's the mean or the proportion. So it will either be the X bar or the P. So it will be your point estimate plus or minus. Remember, plus or minus the plus side tells you the upper limit of your confidence. This will be your upper limit. It's very important to know that if they ask you in the exam or in the assignment, calculate the upper limit, know that from the confidence interval formula, you're only going to calculate the plus side. The minus gives you the lower limit. Lower, lower limit. Always remember that. And it will be plus or minus the critical value. And yeah, I told you that the critical value is something that you already know because the critical value, if we use the example of a Z table, the critical value here is your Z value. So your critical value will be the Z value. But now this Z value, because we have an upper limit and a lower limit, we are going to use a probability from the confidence level. And that probability from the confidence level is going to call it an alpha value. And that probability we will have to split it into two because we're talking about the lower limit and the upper limit. So we will have to divide the alpha value by two. And an alpha value it is a value that comes from the level of confidence. It is your complement of your level of confidence. And we're gonna get there just now, hang on. And then <clears throat> multiply that with your standard error. Now, in the previous uh, study unit, we know what this critical value, uh, your standard error is. If we're using the Z, our standard error will be our population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So it's everything that you've learned in the previous session or the previous study unit. So we just carry on with that. Okay, so that will be the formula. So in a way, this formula, if I write it out for the means, it will be our sample size minus our Z of alpha divided by two times population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And I'm going to put a double colon because this will be my lower limit and I must put it in bracket and I'm going to do my upper limit. Always start with the lower limit than with the upper limit. And this will be your X bar plus Z critical value times the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n and I must close the bracket. And that is your confidence interval formula that you can use. In the beginning, you can start with the plus or minus and as you calculate, because the left hand side, the, the lower limit and the upper limit, left and the right, uh, sorry, the left hand side of the sign, not the left, the right hand side of the sign, which is the critical value, this critical value times the standard error are the same. So there's no need for you to calculate it twice, right? You can calculate it once and only split it when you are about to get to the answer. But we will look at how we do that. So that will be the formula in a nutshell. If we're using the mean, the confidence interval for the proportion when the population standard deviation is given because that's why I'm using the population standard deviation and because we're going to be using the Z table as well. So how do we then find this critical value and what do I mean by the confidence level? And I said alpha value, it is a complement of your confidence interval. So now if our confidence interval 
E is oh not if our confidence interval is represented by one minus alpha, and this confidence uh, level that's what we're going to use to find our alpha value. And you can see that one minus alpha includes alpha, so it will be easy to find that. And we know we will be given the confidence level because we can say this is the same as 95%. Okay, so your confidence interval will contain the unknown population parameter and it is going to be uh, represented as a percentage because it will be 95%, 90%, 80%. And we can write it as follows because if it's 95%, we know that. A 95% is the same as 1 minus alpha. And if it is 1 minus alpha, 1 minus alpha is equal to 0 0.95, which is 0, which is 95%. If we want to make alpha the subject of the formula, so it will be minus 1 plus 0 0.95, and we multiply all the way with a negative, therefore it will be alpha is equals to 1 minus 0 0.95. And our alpha will be equals to 0 0.05. And that will be our alpha value. And this alpha value, it is also what we call a level of significance now. You might get confused. Don't get confused. Confidence level is 95%, right? Get that. 95% is 1 minus alpha. Our alpha value at some point, if not in, in this section, in this study unit, or they might include it in this study unit, we can call this alpha a level of significance. We're going to call it a level of significance or we can call it alpha. It's just alpha or it's just a symbol alpha, which will be 0, 0,05. So with a 95% confidence interval, we will be able to construct a confidence interval because remember from our equation, we require the critical value and using a level of significance of alpha of two, we will use that to find our critical value. Remember that our Z value is alpha over two. And I'm going to also from here say this Alpha over 2, it is our proba probability. So that will be the value we find inside the table, and then we go and find the values outside. So you have done this before. That is why I said it is the same thing that we have done in study unit 7. So we just continue from that. Okay. So how do we then calculate confidence intervals when the population standard deviation is known? <clears throat> so we're going to use the Z table. And that is the table you are familiar with. Remember the table with negative values of Z and the table with positive values of Z you're still going to be getting the same. Now, however, with confidence interval, we're not going to go to the positive side. We're always going to work from the negative side because we're always going to be using the probabilities inside and go and find our Z value outside, right? So this is our alpha divided by two values that we're going to be finding inside the table. And because they are so small, they are not going to be big probabilities. So we're only going to concentrate on the negative side table. Okay. 
So how do we then calculate the confidence interval? Like I said, there are several assumptions that needs to be made as well in terms of confidence intervals for the mean when the population standard deviation is known. Assumption number one, the population standard deviation needs to be given. It needs to be known. It needs to be stated in the statement or it needs to be give, or the statement needs to read in a way or in such a way that you understand that this is the population standard deviation. Population needs to be normally distributed. And if the population is not normally distributed, then we're going to rely on using a larger sample. So our N will be big. And when they, we talk about N being big, we're referring to almost like N of greater than 30. But that is not always going to be the case in your module. Don't worry about too much of that. The most important thing that you need to always constantly be on the lookout for, except for the assumption, it is that statement. The first assumption, your population standard deviation needs to be given or it needs to be known. And we use this formula to calculate or to find or construct our confidence interval. Our point estimate plus or minus the critical value times the standard error. Let's look at an example of how we find the critical value. To find the critical value, if we're using a 95% confidence interval, I'm just gonna black out my screen and we're gonna go manual. So if I have a 95% confidence level, then I'm asked to find the critical value uh, let me know if you are unable to see me. I read pen. I can write with white. Okay, so we know that a 0 0.95 is the same as one minus alpha, right? That's what we know. If we take alpha and make alpha the subject of the formula, alpha, we take it to the other side, therefore one minus, and we bring zero comma, 95 this side, so our alpha will be 0, 0,05. Now, in order for us to find z of alpha divided by 2, we need to find 0, 0,05 divided by 2, and that will be 0, 0,025. So it means we are splitting the sides in half. So on that note, we need to go to the table to go find this critical value. So let's go find the critical value. So you need to go to the Z table. So this is our Z table. Remember that table E, cumulative standardized normal distribution table. So on this table, we are looking for inside the table, we need to look for a value that is closer to 0, 0,025. And because our table has four decimals at most, I can say it will look like 0, 0,0250. So let's go inside the table and look for that value. Zero comma, let's write it here again, zero comma zero two five zero. So we're looking for zero comma zero two five two two six two six two five two five zero. And I go out minus one point nine, minus one point nine, and I go up. And when I go up, when we go up, the last digit is six. So our critical value is minus one point nine. Six. So our critical value is minus 1.96. Now, 
I'm going to tell you with confidence intervals, you can ignore the minus. This minus, we can ignore that. We can write it as 1,96. Only for this purpose, so that for explanation purpose, so that you don't get confused when you plug in the values. We, we discard the negative in front because we will always use the negative side of the table. So you will always have a negative, but we're going to discard the negative. So it means we're going to find the absolute the absolute value of Z, which is 1,96. Okay. <clears throat> and that is our critical value. So I want you to go and find the critical value. So that is your exercise. In two minutes, find the critical value for a 99%. Find a critical value for of a 99% confidence, confidence level, that is your exercise. Are you saying something? Your yes, hear me. You we can hear you. Unless if it's me. Okay, um I wanted to ask the question there on the assumption. You were saying um deviation standard deviation is known. But the notes that I printed from the my UNISA, these are or my modules, says population standard deviation is unknown. Okay, so, we will get to that. So the first assumption, uh, the first one we do is when the population standard deviation is known, therefore it means the population standard deviation will be given. The second one we're going to look at when the population standard deviation is unknown. And I'm going to explain that to you, how you will identify that. And then the last one we will look at the proportions. For now, are you able to calculate or find the confidence level for 99%. We're going to get to to answer that question of yours just now. Do we have an answer? Nothing on the chat. So, um, yes. Uh, the answer is 2.575. You want to write it here? You say the number is 2.575. 2. 2. 5, 5. Okay. How do you get 2.575? Um, because your table, your Z table has only two decimals, right? For this one. So look for the value closest. So how I did it is I looked for. OK, let's 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 do the the whole the whole ex activity together. OK, so the first you say zero comma nine nine is equals to one minus zero comma. Oh, sorry, one nine. One minus alpha, right? And what did you do? What is your alpha? It's 0 0.01. So it was 1 minus 0 0.99 and you say it is 0 0.01. And then we went and you found your alpha divided by 2, which is your 0 0.01 divided by 2, which is equals to the Z of 
Zero point zero zero five. Zero point zero zero five. So there are double zeros. Yes. Two zeros. Okay. So then you went to the table. Okay. I'm gonna remove our previous answer and then write here. 0 0.005. So we need to come to this table here and look for a value that is closer to that, right? Uh, we can put also zero at the end. So I'm gonna go down double zeros, zero nine, zero five, zero four, zero four, zero five. Zero five should be where we are. So somewhere here, 051049. So now if you look at these two values, this one is more than this one is it will be at least that. So I will rather take this value than that value. Because the the um the one it has passed 0 0.5, the other one, if I round it up, it will also still be closer to really the difference is just one point it's point zero zero one in terms of the two of them but i will take this one because i'm gonna explain just now why i'm taking the last one so if i go out 2.5 and i go out eight so our z critical for this will be equals to two point and that is the critical value for when Z, only for Z. This is only, this is only for Z. So for Z, it will be 2.58 at 99%. Now, I just also want to do one last critical value because this one, it is very important for me to also explain why it will be like that because it looks almost exactly, the explanation will will be almost similar to the one that I just gave, but it is as complex as it, it goes. So when it comes to a 90%, so let's look at 90%. So let's look at 90% confidence interval. So at 90%, therefore, it means our alpha value, I'm just going to remove all these values. So at 90, at 90%, our alpha value will be 0, 0,10, right? And we're going to divide our 0, 0,10 and we will get our alpha of 0, 0,05. So we need to go to the table and look for a value that is closer to 0, 0,05 on the table. So this is one of the exceptions. One of the exceptions out of all. So inside this table, we need to look for 0, 0,05. So let's go 0, 0,0. So we're still on the two digits of zeros. So we need to go to where it's one digit of zero. And I think these are the values 0, 0,4, 0, 0,5. That's what we are at. And 0, 0,50 and 0, 0,495. Now, those two values are one difference up five or zero point zero 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 five up or zero comma zero 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 five down right this is one of those rare cases where instead of selecting either one of them we're going to choose both of them we're going to choose both of them therefore it means our critical value will be somewhere in between when we go to the top. So we're going to look at minus 1.6, 1.6, and at the top, I'm gonna go and look at both of them. Oh, not there. I'm selecting the wrong, the wrong values there, which is between 0 0.04 and 0 0.05 on this one with all other critical values the other critical values we look for the number closest 
this is one of the exceptions for a 90% confidence interval. When we go to the top, we say it is four, five. It will be one comma six, four, five. You need to always remember this. It, we take the average of the two values. That will be one comma six, four, five. That is the only exception. Okay. Moving on, unless if there is a question regarding the confidence interval, when I move from this slide, I cannot come back because I've blacked out the original slide. This will disappear. If there are any questions, ask now. If no questions, then we move on. Okay, no questions. Okay, why Lizzie, question why specifically that no, one we take? That's how, that's how the critical values okay, have no, been I defined. Right, and that is why I'm saying okay. for um for ninety percent, it is the only exception where we take one comma six four five instead of one comma six five or one comma six four, but we take one comma six uh, six four five. That is the only exception. The other ones, you need to leave the answer to two decimals. So it means it's one, it's in two decimal, one before, one before comma and two after the comma. So always remember that. But we're gonna get to that just now. Uh, the table with critical values, which I, I'm going to say, keep that table close by. Even when you write in the exam, you don't have to go through the steps that I just explained right now to go find the critical values, because you will have that table already with critical values defined and it will save you a whole lot of time. I was just explaining and showing you because sometimes you might be asked a question which is based on concepts in terms of how do we find the critical value? If you don't know how to find the critical value, how would you answer that question? So I needed to take you through that because I won't know the type of questions you will receive in your assignment or in your exam. So I need to give you as much information as possible, but to the, um, Shortcut is use the table that I'm going to share with you just now, which is this table, which gives you almost all the critical values that can be asked. The ones highlighted in orange, the 90%, 95%, the 99%, these are the most frequent used critical values. So even today, next week, when you go write the exam, when you are answering assignments, you either going to get one of these three, either calculating a 90%, a 95 or a 99. You just need to know the critical value. So instead of you going to the table and going finding the critical value, you can use this as your critical value. You look at the confidence interval or the confidence level that they would have given you because they would have said a 95% confidence interval which means they're referring to the confidence level. What is the critical value? You can calculate the critical value or you can come here and select which critical value corresponds with the confidence level. And these are the critical values. We found that one, I found that one, and I showed you this last one, which is the only one you can see there. It's the only one with three decimals. The rest are two decimals. Always pay attention to this. It's very, very important. Using the wrong confidence interval, you will get the wrong answer. Let's look at an example of how we find confidence interval for the population when the standard deviation is known. Population standard deviation is known. A sample of 11 circuits from a large normal population has a mean resistance of 2.20. OHMS. We know from the past testing that the population standard deviation is 0 0.35. Determine a 95% confidence interval for the true mean resistance of the population. So taking this circuit, which is from uh, probably um, for the electricity and so on. And we need to check if our true mean resistance of the population is within this 
confidence interval. So based on the information given, we are given a sample, which is our N sample size, sample of 11 seconds from a large population with a mean of 2.2, which is our mu. We know from the past testing that the population standard deviation, so they have given you sigma, so it means our population standard deviation is known because they have given it to us. So because it's known, we know that we're going to use plus or minus the critical value of alpha divided by two times the standard deviation over the square root of n or times the standard error. We know how to find the critical value because finding the critical value, we can come to this table and say at 95%, this is our critical value, right? Or we can go to the table. We can go to the table and go find alpha of 0 0.05, starting with 1 minus 0 0.95 is equals to alpha, which then our alpha is 0, 0, 0.05. And we go and find this by finding the alpha of 0, 0.05 divided by 2, which is 0, 0.0250. And we go to the table and we know that we did find it. It was. It was minus 1.96, right? And we know that it was 1.96. So we can then just go and substitute into the formula and calculate. So our mean is 2.20. Our critical value is what we found from the table or from the Z table. Our standard deviation is 0 0.35 and our n square root of n of 11 and you just calculate the left hand side which is 2.20 plus or minus the right hand side which will be one time 1.96 times the standard error which gives us 0 0.2068 so from here the step that is missing in between that and that is to split 2.20 minus 0 0.2068 and 2.20 plus 0 0.2068. And when you calculate the site, you get 1.9932. When you calculate the site, you get 2.4068. Therefore, our population parameter lies between 1.9932 and 2.4068. Based on this information, we can safely interpret the answer by saying we are 95% confident that the true mean resistance is between 1.9932 and 2.4068. Although the true mean may vary or may not, be in the interval, but we can safely say we are 95% or 95% of the intervals formed in this manner will contain the true mean. And this, we do not have to worry about knowing how to interpret the intervals. Like I said, I'm just giving you more extra information. No way in your modules, even in the past, have they asked you to interpret the confidence intervals. This is your exercise. I'm going to give you five minutes to do this exercise. I'm going to give you also the formula. The alpha divided by two times the standard error. Read the question. I've highlighted the important thing, which is the population standard deviation, because we know that it is given, therefore our population standard deviation is known and that is why we use the Z. What is the confidence interval at 90% confidence level? You have five minutes 
so that I'm not the only one talking. Um, we will, if you are done, uh, you don't have to tell me the answer. You just indicate that you are done and I would prefer you to write on the chat so that I can monitor the, the, the chat to see how many of you are done. Um, just put there done, otherwise the others can just like your done statement. You don't have to give the answer right away. So your five minutes has already started. I uh, will see you at. Sixteen ten. Others, are you still busy? I see one person of said done. I'm also done, Lizzie. It's just that I don't know where to type. I've been trying to figure it out. Ah. Okay. okay. So let's do the answers together. Okay. What is our mean? Hundred. Our mean is hundred. Our n twenty-five. Fifty. Uh, uh, 50. fifty. N is fifty. And our 
standard deviation? 25. 25. Let's substitute into the formula and calculate. 100 plus or minus our critical value. What is the critical value? We are looking for a 90%. Therefore, our alpha. 1. Our alpha is. 0, 0,10, right? And our Z alpha divided by 2. Which is. 0, 0,10 divided by 2, which is Z of 0, 0,05. What is the critical value at 90%? 0.5. Yes. It is the one with the exception. It's 1, 1, 1,645 times our standard deviation of 25 over our square root of 50. Now, we can split this into two. Those without a calculator, we can do this. Um, 25 divide by the square root of 50 equals multiply that. So I'm going to work from here to uh, from right to left. Multiply that with 1.645. Equals, and you will have to write the whole number as you see it. So the whole number is 5,8159. I must not be able to write all of it. So on the left hand side, I will have 100 minus, and the answer was 5.8. 5.8. Five nine five three. Five nine five three. Two seven five. Two seven five. You need to write all the decimals so that you get the same answer as everyone. If you cut off, you're not gonna get the same answer. Zero hundred plus on this side we write the plus side. Five comma eight one. Five nine da, da 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 da. You must write all of them, and then from here you can then just calculate the answer. So I'm gonna use those with the Casio calculator. Easy. You're going to use the whole equation as it is. So I'm gonna start with hundred minus. I'm gonna do the minus first, and I'm gonna say one point. 645 and I'm going to open the bracket and include my fraction and say it is 25 divide by the square root of 50 and go out out again and close the bracket and say answer and the answer is 94.1 840 I must just look at how many decimals they've got Four decimals. So ninety four point eighteen forty. Ninety four point eighteen forty. And to enter the upper limit, just use my arrows. Go and delete and put the plus and equal and the answer is 105 8159 rounding off that will be 68160 this will be 105 
0.8160 because I'm rounding off. When I round off, this will be 0 adding 1 to 5, that will be 60. And looking at the answer, the answer is option 1. Option 1. Next exercise, that will be the last exercise. On this, um, Africa Check is interested in the activity of few fake news, which is the same question that we had previously, if you read it. The next step they say, suppose the sample size increased to 100. So now the sample size increased from 50 to 100. It's very important that you read the statements um, as you answer the questions, especially in the exam or in the assignment, because one might follow the other. While the mean and the standard deviation remain the same, so it means our mean will still be 100, our standard deviation will still be 25. What is the 90% confidence interval estimate? So going back to our previous one, we know that we calculated it this way. Um, we're going to continue doing that, but changing our sample from 50 to 100. So let's do that. Our X bar plus or minus our critical value of alpha divided by 2 times the standard deviation over the square root of n, which is our standard error. And 100 was our our mean plus or minus our critical value, we found that it was 1.645 times our standard deviation was 25 divided by 100. Go to my calculator because I've got the values already on my calculator. I just need to change a couple of things. Start with the negative side, change the negative. I'm going to have to go and change the 50 to a 100. 100. So does it look exactly the same as what I have here? Yes, it does. So the answer will be 95.8875. 95.8875. Ninety-five point eight eight seven five. Go to the positive side. Delete plus answer. Change one hundred four point one one two five. One hundred four point one one. at the options 95 95 they are the 95s 88 75 which means option number four is the correct answer are there any questions okay in the absence of questions let's move on to when the population standard deviation is unknown so now I can see that I'm running out of time as well. Okay, so when the population standard deviation is unknown, we're going to use the T table. Okay, <clears throat> so if the population standard deviation is unknown, then we can assume that we are given the sample standard deviation and we're going to we substitute on the formula where we see the population standard deviation, we're going to use S. So where do we use that? So remember, we have our Z alpha over two standard deviation over the square root of N. Now, because our population standard deviation is not given yet, we're going to use S, but we also going to change this and use T alpha over two. Because this introduces extra uncertainty since S is the variable from the sample or it can vary from sample to sample. And in that case, then we will use a T distribution 
instead of a normal, a normal distribution. So that hence we're going to use a t-table or a t-test table. So the formula will still remain the same. The point estimate, so it will be our point estimate because we're still calculating confidence interval for the mean, plus or minus. Our critical value will be T of alpha divided by two. We know how to find the critical value or the alpha over two. We know how, how to find the alpha value, which is the level of confidence. And times here, yeah, then we will be times by the standard error, but using the sample standard deviation. And that is the formula we're going to be using. The assumptions for this will be the population standard deviation will be unknown. So the assumptions should be it is unknown. The population is normally distributed. And if the population is not normally distributed, then the sample size must be large. Those are the assumptions for using a T distribution or to finding confidence interval for the mean when population standard deviation is unknown. Very important in your statement and the question, look out. Did they give you the population standard deviation or did they give you the sample standard deviation? How will you know that? Sometimes the question might say with the population, um, the, uh, from the population, this is the standard deviation, this is the mean. Sometimes they might say from the sample, the mean is, the population is, oh sorry, the mean is and the standard deviation is from the sample, then you will know that here we're talking about the sample. Population, uh, sample standard deviation and sample mean, right? Or they will give you S is equals to, and you will know that that is a sample standard deviation. So we're going to use the student T distribution to find the confidence interval and the formula. We've already touched on the formula. It looks like this. Now, how do we find the critical value on the T table? It's different to how we find the critical value on the Z table. On the T table, we use alpha of alpha divided by two and the degrees of freedom. What do we mean by the degrees of freedom? A degrees of freedom is your sample size minus one. So if I have a sample size of 25, Therefore, it will be 25 minus 1, then my degrees of freedom will be 24. If my alpha value is 0 0.05 at 95% confidence interval, therefore my critical rule, my alpha divided by 2 will be 0 0.05 divided by 2, and that will be 0, 0.0250. And we need to go and find this critical value on the table. So now our critical value will be 0, 0,0250 and the degrees of freedom of 24. Let's see if we can get that. We go to the T table. It's called critical values of T. This is the table we're going to be using. From the critical values of T, how the table looks, it has the cumulative probabilities and it's got the upper tail areas. You are going to ignore everything above. You're not even going to pay attention to that because it's going to confuse you if you like. So ignore that. See how I'm making it even non-readable from my side. That's what you're going to do. You're going to ignore that. Not going to add any value going to use the upper tail area, which are the values closest to the table. We're also going to use our degrees of freedom on the side. So remember, our task is to find 0, 0,0250 and the degrees of freedom of 24. So let's do that. At the top, we're going to look for 0, 0,0025, which is the that we are looking for, and going to find the degrees of freedom of 24 where they both meet. That is our critical value. Easy, right? Easy, 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 easy. That's how we will find the critical value, which will be 2 comma 0 0639.
And that's how we will find the critical value. Moving on, <clears throat> I've already done the critical value. So with the T distribution, there are a couple of things that you also need to pay attention to. As the value of your N, which is your sample size, as your sample size increase, your T table, the T table that we have, yeah, as the value of N increases, you will notice as the value of N, which creates the degrees of freedom, the more it increases, the more your values of uh, crit um, your critical values tend to be the same as your normal distribution values. So they it is your critical value, critical value, critical value, critical value, critical value. As you can see, almost exactly similar to the critical value of Z. And that's what we're trying to explain with this slide to say, as your values of N increases, your T distribution tends to become normally distributed as well. The smaller your N, the flatter the curve will be. And the bigger your N, the normally distributed your curve will be or will look. So a T distributions are also a belly shaped curves, but they are not symmetric the same way as a normal distribution is. Right, we already touched on how we find the critical value. So I don't know if I need to repeat that on this slide because this is the same. So if N is three, we find the degrees of freedom, three minus one is two. And if our alpha was 0, 0,1, Alpha divided by 2 is 0, 0,05. And then we go to the table, look for 2, look for 0, 0,05 where they meet. That is our critical value. Same principle. Um, not going to touch on this because it touches on the same answer that I was giving to say as the values of T of your degrees of freedom increases, as you can see from 10 to 30, and to infinity, the values of your T test becomes normal distribution critical values. Right. So let's look at an example. A random sample of N is equal to 25 as the mean of 50 and the standard deviation of 8. As you can see here, because they gave it to us in symbol format, it's easy to identify that this is a sample standard deviation. So therefore, our population standard deviation here, it is unknown. And then it means we're going to use T distribution table to find the T distribution table or the critical value of a T distribution. We use the degrees of freedom. N is 25. 25 minus 1 is 24. Your T alpha divided by 2 alpha of 95 it's alpha of 0, 0,05 divided by 2 is 0, 0,25. 0, 0,025. Uh, and we did go and find this critical value and we found that it was 2,0639 on the table. Calculating the critical value or the, sorry, the confidence intervals. Our mean, we were given it's 50 plus or minus. Our critical value, we did go find it. It was 2.0639 times the standard error, which is our standard deviation, which is 8, divided by the square root of uh, our sample size. Our sample size is 25, which is the square root of 25. So 50 plus or minus 2.0639 times 8 divided by square root of 25 gives us on the lower limit 46.69.8 and on the upper limit it gives 53.302 or we can write it and say the population mean parameter lies between 46 and 53. Any questions? If there are no questions, 
we will move on to the next slide. Are there questions? Told you that today's session will be jam packed. So just and, out of curiosity. Um, yes. When you, I actually asked in the uh, chat there, but when you were talking about the fact that as N increases, then um, T tends to look the same as um, Z. Now, is that why they say if you don't have a normal distribution, then you should use a, a larger sample? Yes, but also um, as well with a larger sample, it means um, you're trying to get as much closer to what the pop to represent the population. Because a smaller sample sometimes might it might be very difficult to represent what the population looks like. Right, because at the end of the day, the result you need to infer them back to the population. And if the sample doesn't look exactly like the sample, uh, sorry, the population, your sample doesn't look exactly like your population, it's going to be very difficult to infer the results as well. Most of the time, if your sample is normally distributed, then yes, you can infer back the results. But if your sample is small and your population is, um, your, your data is not normally distributed, then you will need to use T distribution in order for you to at least have some form of a normal distribution to your uh, results as well. Okay, 100%. Second question, I'm looking at this one, I was trying to follow just using the table, and I seem to be getting a different value um, for T 0 0.025. Is it me getting it wrong? 0 0.025 and... Yeah, and a degree of freedom of 24. 24, 0 0.2,05. So check carefully on your table and which table are you using? Is it, are you using a textbook? And yes, if, the textbook. If, it's a, if it's your textbook, is it three decimals or five decimals? You just um, need to pay attention to that because. Ah, uh, okay. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, if it's it, five it's decimals, decimals or if it's three decimals, you will have six, four, right? And the answer you yes. will get won't be exactly the same as the answer we get because of the decimal places. Um, okay, I will advise all of you to use this table that I shared with, with you if you don't know where it is. So if you are part of the, um, if you are part of you you joined the, the 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 teams group. I've uploaded the file here and the files, and this is the table so that you can have access to this. And this is as closest as what you will get if they provide you with tables in the exam as well. So use that use this table. So the notes for today are here because I couldn't upload them as well. Okay, so 100%. Thanks. Let's move on then to and look at some exercise. Um, I've got two exercises, but I'm going to use one. I'm going to leave one out. So let's look at this one. The human resource director of a large corporation wishes to study absenteeism among the clerical workers at the corporation's central office during the previous year. A random sample of 25 clerical workers revealed a mean absenteeism of 9.7 days with the variance of 16 days. Assume the population of absences is normally distributed. The 95% confidence interval for the average number of days of absence for the clerical last year is. Now, let's read this. Carefully and identify what we're given here. So, a random sample 
of 25, that is our n, reveals that the mean, because this is a random sample, right? A random sample has a of 25, reveals the mean of 9.7, this is our x bar, with a variance. So now, because this is one sentence, right? With a variance, of 16 because this variance is from this sample of 25. We can assume that this is our S squared because our variance is S squared. And if we're going to assume that the population is normally distributed, like we know, the first assumption is the population needs to be normally distributed. The 95% confidence interval, so it means our one minus alpha is 0, 95, therefore our alpha will be 0, 0,05, right? So we need to go and find our critical value. The other thing, our population, population standard deviation is unknown because they have given us the variance. Now, since they have given us the variance, which is a squared of 60, we need to find S which will be the square root of 16, which is equals to four, right? That is the other thing that you need to worry about. What is the other thing? Now, we need to find the degrees of freedom. Our degrees of freedom is N minus one. Our N is 25, so it's 24 minus one, which is equals to, oh, sorry, 25 minus one. I'm already giving an answer there which is equal to 24, right? Our alpha divide by two, which will be 0, 0,0. Oh, what is 0, 0,05 divided by two is 0, 0,025, zero, right? Now, to find the critical value, we did find this critical value, right? I don't have to go and find again on the table. which is the critical value of 0, 0,0250 and 24. We did find this. What was the critical value? It's this, it's the same, right? We did find it was 2,0639. As we can see that most of these exercises, they repeat like the critical value and the n sometimes are almost exactly the same 2 comma 0 6 3 9 is that what we got 369 2 comma 3 6 9 6 3 9 oh gosh am i that's line 6 3 9 6 Six three three nine. Okay, and then we can then go and find alpha, uh, the mean plus or minus t alpha divided by two and s divided by the square root of s, which our x bar is. 9.7 plus or minus our critical value of 2,0639 times our S. We found that it was 4 over the square root of 25. And we can go and calculate it. I'm going to first start with the minus. So it's 9.7 minus 2.0639 times fraction 4 divided by square root of 25, which you can also say the square root of 25 is 5. But I'm just, I just like using the calculator. And the answer is 
and the oh sorry i see where my problem is with this because i forgot to put the nine nine you will see that how it changes the whole answer as well 0 0.048888 so one mistake, you get the wrong answer and then you struggle. How many? Eight, three, eight, zero, four, eight, eight, eight. And we go to the plus side. Change the minus to a plus. And 11.35112. 11.35112. Looking at the answer, we've got three decimal, four decimals. So I've kept how many decimals? One, two, three, four, five. I've kept five. If I leave it to three decimals, let's start there because for four decimals, it doesn't work. It's not the answer. Uh, we can leave it to three decimals. 8.049 and 11.0. Three, five, one. Ah, option two. There we go. Option two, option two, option two. So on your own, you can go through this one. Um, because I want to do the last two bits of the work in the next 20 minutes or less. Hi, Lizzie. Yes. Sorry to disturb. Mm -hmm. So I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. If, for example, you work in the HR department and you want to do this kind of a calculation, who determines the confidence interval? You. Best question. And then um, the second one is, if you don't have a, a big company, do you just use, you know, all the number of people like let's say for a certain department let's say you're checking for a certain department or let's say you're checking for the whole company to just use all the number of people and then you said i determined the confidence interval how do i con uh, how do i determine it okay so um the to cut the story short um uh the confidence interval is set by the researcher themselves so in a in a in a practical um, work environment, right? You you can use different confidence intervals depending on the margin of error you want to include as oh you you want to take care of because at ninety five your margin of error is five percent, at ninety percent the margin of error is um, um is ten percent. Now, if for example you work in in an HR, it's not 95% is a good one to use. It's it's a normal standard one to use and at the 95% because you are allowing for that 5% margin of error in case of the sample that you chose is not a true representative of your population, right? But at least it allows for 5%. If you work in um, uh, this for HR, it's fine with 95 if you even with 10 percent it will be fine but if you work in a medical center where you are determining the confidence interval for the sicknesses of like the average sickness of people coming through in your surgery or in the medical center you will need to use a 99 percent because you only want to allow one percent margin of error because if you allow five percent margin of error you can just imagine what the the consequence might be you might you might be giving wrong wrong medication to wrong people right but in an hr which is at a low risk a 95 percent it's fine but the researcher determines that in terms of the sample so it will depend on you the researcher what you want to determine whether is it for the entire population which is the entire company or is it for a certain department and then you also it will also depend on the type of sampling that you want to do do you want to sample from the department because your department if it has 100 people you sample you only take records of 20 staff members then it's a sample 
and that sample is it a true representative of the whole department? Does it include the people of color, uh, people with different qualification at different levels? All those things you need to take care of when you're doing this type of analysis. But in a nutshell, you determine as a researcher, you determine what level of significance you want or the, the uh, confidence interval you need, right? So without um, answering more of work related questions, let's move on because I've got two sections that I need to get through to explaining as well. It's a nice conversation to have, I know. Um, especially if you want to take this and start using it in, in real life. OK, so I said this, you will do it on your own. Sorry. Oh, I say thank you. Yeah, so this you will do it on your at your own time pace. You can take a screenshot of it. We can come back to the recording. Now let's look at confidence interval for the proportion. Um, Confidence interval for the proportion, we're going to go back to the Z table. And then when your confidence interval proportion, your population proportion, oh, not your population proportion, your sample proportion is not given, you will have to calculate the sample proportion. So an estimate or an interval estimate for the population proportion can be calculated by adding an allowance for uncertainty to the sample proportion. And if your sample proportion is not given, remember, you will be given the observation satisfying the proportion divided by the sample size, and you can calculate the sample proportion. In study unit seven, we used the standard error if you remember uh, that for the standard deviation of the sampling proportion or what we call the standard error, we use the square root of your population proportion times one minus the population proportion divided by n. So now with confidence interval, because you don't know what your true population proportion is, we are given the sample proportions. You're going to use this formula to find the standard error. So our standard error, will be defined by your sample proportion times one minus the sample proportion divided by n, the square root of that. So the formula, the same way, point estimate plus or minus the critical value times the standard error. Our point estimate here will be our p, which if we're not given p, we know that we're going to use x divided by n, which are observations satisfying the sample divided by n to calculate our p, plus or minus the critical value. Just give me a second, I'll be back. I just want to do something quickly. One second, one second. So the formula, your point estimate will be your sample proportion times the critical value. Like I said, we use the Z value. So our uh, critical value, Z alpha divided by two times the standard error, which is the square root of your sample proportion times one minus the sample proportion divided by A. 
Let's look at an example. A random sample of 100 people shows that 25 are left-handed. Form a 95% confidence interval for the true proportion of left-handers. Now, the question has given us the sample, which is N, and they also gave us how many number of people are left-handed because it's from the sample. So they didn't give us our P, so we can go and calculate P, which is our sample proportion, which will be X divided by N and substitute into the formula. And we know that the formula will just be your <coughs> sample proportion plus or minus your critical value times the standard error. And we substitute our P is 25 divided by 100 plus or minus our critical value at 95% confidence interval. Remember the table at 95% confidence interval, our alpha is 0 0.05 divided by 2, which is 0 0.025. And we go to the table, 0 0.25 corresponds to negative 1.6 on your left and at the top, and negative 1.9 on the left and at the top 6. Uh, 0 0.06, so therefore our critical value will be 1.96 times the standard error, which is the square root of your sample proportion times 1 minus the sample proportion, which is 0 0.25, 1 minus 0 0.25, which is 0 0.75 divided by N of 100. Mm, so calculating what the standard error is, we find 0 0.04433 times 1,96 and expanding it into the formula and finding the confidence interval. And we find that the uh, true proportion of the mean lenders, uh, left handers are between 0, or is between 0 0.165 and 0.3349. We are, and we, in terms of interpretation, we can say we are 95% confident that the true percentage of left handers in the population is between 16.9, uh, 16.51 and 33.49%. Yeah, I've also had a um, an exercise for you to do, which yeah they've given you your sample proportion in percentage already. So and your sample size, and you can go and do this at your own pace because I want to move to the next section uh, in the last six minutes and calculate it at ninety five ninety nine percent. So you can go and use the table and look at ninety. 9% confidence interval, and that will be at 99%, it will be 2,5. So your critical value of alpha divided by 2 at 99% will be 2,58. If I still remember my, my statistics very well. Okay. And then you can calculate and find the answer. The last bit that I want to share with you so that you don't get a surprise when you get to the uh, assignment. And we haven't touched it, but it's something that we have always been working with. So what I'm going to refer to it is this part. This is what we call a margin of error. So from the X bar plus minus Z alpha times sigma over the square root of N and Z alpha plus or minus T alpha divided by 2 times your S over the square root of N and P plus or minus Z alpha over 2 times P 1 minus P over n. So all this, all this, everything here, it is what we're going to be calling the margin of error or 
we can also refer to it as the sampling. The sampling F. So that calculates the margin of error or the sampling F. So if anyway in the question or in the assignment they ask you to calculate or find the margin of error, they are asking you to calculate that. Just find the Z and multiply that, uh, find the critical value and multiply the critical value with the standard error. That's what this is all about. So the margin of error is also called the sampling error. It is the amount of or imprecision in the estimate of the population parameter, or we can say is the amount that is added or subtracted, because remember we do plus or minus, is the amount that is added or subtracted to the point estimate to form a confidence interval. And we can do it for the mean or for the proportion. And depending on for the mean, remember, for the mean it can either be when the population standard deviation is known and when the population standard deviation is known, we use the Z times the standard error. When it is unknown, we use T times the standard um, times the standard error. And we are able so that we call it this um, calculation, we call it the margin of error and it's always denoted by an E, which is that margin of error. For the proportion, we use Z alpha times the square root of your sample proportion times one minus sample proportion divided by N and that will give you your margin of error. And that is it for today. So I've also included some activities that you can go through. Um, and one of those activities is this. Which of the following statement is incorrect? And some of these activities, we will do them when we do question and answer the following after this week, I think. The next the follow after the hypothesis testing, that other week, we can also include the same questions again to answer them. But these are the type of questions that are in here. Which of the following statement is incorrect? And here they're talking about when we increase the sample size, what happened to the confidence interval? So now, in order for you to answer this question, you should have already also calculated some confidence intervals before. So you can use any of the examples that you have. For example, you can use this and say, because my sample size here is 100. If I increase this to 150, what happens to this interval? Does it become bigger? Does it become smaller? If I decrease it to 50, what happens to this interval? That's what they are talking about uh, Yeah, with this question. Does your confidence estimate becomes narrower or it becomes wider? Um, and you can do that by placing the values uh, and say this is the largest value, this is the smallest value, and you calculate the, the first one and see if it falls there or there, and then calculate, reduce your N and see if it falls within there and then, and if it falls within there and then, and you will be able to see. You do the same because this talks to N, so you look at the N, and then you also look at if you increase the value of your alpha. How do you know about the, not the value of your alpha, your confidence level, which is one minus alpha. You also start wider and you increase or decrease your confidence interval. So for example, uh, you will start with your, um, um, mm, let's see, uh, your, let's say this is your 90% and your, uh, 95 percent and then your 99 percent and you can just check if what I'm referring to is what you see when you are reducing or increasing your your confidence interval so that is something you need to um, watch out for in terms of the type of questions that they will be asking the other question they will expect you to take the information calculate the confidence intervals this uses the same the same information. So this applies to the same issue that I've just raised here, yeah? using the same <coughs> information by changing the confidence interval 
do you get the same answers as they have? Because they are just changing the confidence interval for this question. Um, do you get the same answer? Are they, then you choose the correct answer there. Or is this one incorrect and the others are correct? Or is this and that incorrect and the one is correct? You need to test and validate each statement uh, that is there. This other one um, also talks to the same uh, to say, if these are your confidence intervals, do you know how to, how would they have calculated this? Which one of these represent a 90%, a 95%, and a 99%? Taking a guidance from these questions, you can be able to answer this question because the bigger or the smaller your lower interval to your upper interval and how it decreases with time. Because if you look at this question, you can see that at 95%, if these are the true values of the confidence interval and this question is correct, you can look at this, how the intervals varies between the confidence levels, right? And that you can use the same logic to check how the confidence intervals varies and you can put the confidence levels next to each one of them and say this is the 90%, 99, 95. Then otherwise in the, in the assignment, you might get straightforward questions where they give you the date, the information statement, and they ask you to calculate a confidence interval. Or they can only ask you to find the upper limit. So you need to just make sure that you know how to find the upper limit. Remember the upper limit, it is where it is a plus sign. Or they can ask you to find the lower limit. The lower limit, it is minus. So they can ask you to find confidence intervals and confidence intervals and confidence intervals. In summary, you have learned the basic concepts of confidence interval, how to construct confidence interval, how to construct confidence intervals for when the population standard deviation is known and when it is unknown and for the proportion. And you, I've just shown you or gave you a snippet in terms of how to find the margin of error, which you would have calculated the margin of error every time you calculated the confidence intervals, right? You would have, you can find that. And that is the end of the session for today. I'm going to publish this, but I'm going to split it into part A and part B so that the recordings might be not too long, like a two hour recording. So I will split it in, in half, one hour, one hour for each and publish that. Okay. Um, are there any questions, comments, query before we close? Um, one question. Yes. So on um, some of the so on most of the questions where one um, you would maybe say increase the sample size and they they ask you um, um, how your answer changes. So I see that on most of them, it's only one variable changing at a time. Is it? Can we expect any questions where you have two variables changing? Um, not necessarily, but yes, you can because they can ask you if you change two of them, um, it doesn't change how you will calculate them, right? Because if I come yeah. here, if they, if they say now, uh, uh, if you're, uh, this one won't be the, the, the nice one to use, but let's use the, this one. If they say, uh, your some your standard deviation changed or oh no the critical value because usually the thing that will affect what happens will be your critical value or your sample size because if your sample size then your standard error either reduces or increases right so they can ask you how does it affect your standard error if you change your standard deviation and your sample size what will happen to the confidence interval or if you change your critical value uh, or your your confidence level and the sample size what how does it affect your confidence interval you can they can ask you that but you just need to test it and you can test it using any anything any previous question is it's just that they want to see if you understand the logic and you know 
how to answer this. And sometimes um, I think in the books, if you, you can also check in the textbook, if they are describing this in terms of um, when they explain the, the, uh, the impact of critical values on or the confidence level on the confidence interval. And other than that, it's something that you can test and check. Okay, okay are there I'm any sure. other questions? Okay, yeah, if there are no questions, remember also margin of error means the same thing as the sampling error is just the 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 numbers to the left that you need to calculate after the plus or minus for any of them. Right. So in the absence of questions and comments, have a lovely Sunday afternoon and see you next week Sunday. Thank Bye. you. See you.